Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to another weekly reading wrap-up. I should have filmed this earlier in the day before I did garden work because now I look and feel like a house troll. <laughs> There are not enough hours in today for me to get everything done that I need to do, so we're just we're just going to go with this. <laughs> so, let's talk about what I read this past week. I'll start with the manga, actually. I read two manga. The first was the second omnibus of The Rose of Versailles by Ryuka Ikeda. I've actually talked about the first omnibus in my June wrap-up, which is coming very soon. It's filmed, I just need to edit it. Um, so yeah, I've already talked about this in a video that you will see after this. Um, but this is a historical romance that came out in the 1970s, um, so it is some classic shoujo manga. I learned about this from Rhea at the Book Finch, who always has interesting manga recommendations, and it, is, it mainly follows Oscar, who is a noblewoman being raised as a man, as her father's heir. Uh, she's also a royal guard to Marie Antoinette, and it basically follows the events of the royal court and France in the lead up to the French Revolution, and all of the romantic entanglements and stuff between the characters. So you have um, Oscar, who is a very, very attractive woman, also a very attractive male presenting person who has women falling in love with her, <laughs> and then Marie Antoinette, who's having an affair with somebody else, and just all of this. It's very emotional, it's very melodramatic, some of it is based on real history, like the affair of the necklace, for example, which is in um, the second omnibus, but I'm sure that a lot of creative liberties were taken with the actual history, so I'm enjoying it very much, but I'm not taking it very seriously. I also read volume 10 of Oku the Inner Chambers by Fumi Yoshinaga. This is a long-running alternate history series about the Tokugawa shogunate, but all the shoguns are female, um, and women are in power in Japan due to a plague. Um, I'm not going to recap much here with the plot because that would be half the series and many decades and many generations of characters, but volume 10 was a really good installment in the series, but it was also one of the most like tragic and sad. Um, my two favorite characters who really like revitalized my interest in the series die in this and in pretty horrible ways. It begins with a lot of hope for the future and then basically a villain is introduced and changes the course of everything and it's really sad because you get this glimpse at how the world could have been and then it's taken away and wow that is relevant to the modern world right now, I just realized. Anyway, <laughs> it was good, but it made me very sad while reading it, and I'm not sure what's next for this because, like, my favorite characters died. We're gonna be on to a new cast of characters in the next volume, probably, so I will continue reading, but I think my emotions need a little bit of a break before I get to volume 11. Last week I talked about Of Dragons, Feasts, and Murders by Aliette de Bodard, which really surprised me. I loved it. Fantasy, murder, mystery investigations, and you betcha I read the second novella right away. This one is called Of Charms, Ghosts, and Grievances, and my favorite dynamic in this is the soft husband, stabby husband thing between Tuan and his husband Asmodeus. Um, in this one, they are both back in the underwater dragon kingdom, and this time they are babysitting children. And while they're doing this, a ghost child shows up, which is quite alarming, and the ghost leads them to the body of a murdered court official, and they investigate this, and things turn very violent very quickly. I was surprised at, like, the pretty high stakes and violence in this. Like, somebody wants these people dead, and they were willing to kill very powerful, important people, as well as children, which is kind of like, whoa. Um, there's also a lot of tension in this between uh, Tuan and Asmodeus. There's like a real conflict in their relationship, which was really interesting. I thought that the plot of this was stronger than the plot of the previous story, but I also think that just the tension, the stakes in the story were better because of that conflict between the two main characters and the will they actually work through this, this difficult time in their relationship. 
Anyway, I really enjoyed this. I inhaled this story. I love the characters. I enjoy this world um, a lot more in this series. I did not get along with it in the Dominion of the Fallen books at all, so I hope that there will eventually be a third installment. I did read more by Nancy Warren as well. I listened to the audiobook of The Vampire Book Club, which is a spin-off in the same world as The Vampire Knitting Club, as you might expect. There are even some crossover characters in this one. Um, I liked this much more than The Great Witch's Baking Show series, which, which was fine, but I just felt like it has so many like character similarities to the Knitting Club books. I thought Poppy and Lucy were way too similar as characters, but but the book club series follows a middle-aged American woman who has been a practicing witch for decades, and um, her, her name is Quinn, and she ends up in Ireland working at a bookstore for reasons. She's done something technically wrong, so her coven kind of sends her elsewhere for a while. And on her first day in her bookstore, she stumbles across the body of a dead man. <laughs> and investigations ensue. She also encounters the um, owner of the local castle, Lachlan, who also appeared in the Knitting Club books, um, though very briefly. Uh, he is a vampire and she very soon finds out that he is and that he has um, other vampires living with him. They do have a book club in her bookstore. She's invited. Uh, so yeah, I enjoyed everything about this except for one thing. And I would love to know if anybody else has read this book and felt the same way. Like, has anybody else noticed this? Quinn is a very judgmental person. And like, in a way that's just very like middle-aged American Karen sometimes. Um, her thought processes, just the assumptions that she makes about some people and situations are very, they're unkind in some ways, but they're also just judgmental in the way that she's basically a city girl and she's now in a very small like rural village in a different country. And instead of like taking a step back and just like observing and getting to, to know the people and their ways and everything, she just makes a whole bunch of stereotypical assumptions about people. And I don't know. I think, this is just my opinion, but I think that she has written this way to make her seem older as a way to differentiate her from other main characters that Nancy Warren has written, but I don't think that a 45-year-old woman has to be unkind and judgmental and a bit snobby to appear middle-aged, you know? It really bugs me, and if there's anything that will get me to stop reading this series, it will be this character trait, so I hope that it's really toned down in the later books. So I will be continuing. I've got books two and three on hold, and I hopefully get them pretty soon, so cross fingers, I warm up to the character a little bit more. And lastly, I listened to the audiobook of Chemistry for Breakfast by Maithi Nguyen Kim. Um, this is translated into English from German, and I don't think there's any translator's information in the audiobook, so I will dig up the translator's name. Um, I had my eye on this for a while because I really want to branch out um, reading nonfiction about other sciences. I've read a lot about physics and astronomy and cosmology over the years, and I would now like to read a bit more nonfiction about like chemistry and math and things like that. So it's a bit harder to find those, unfortunately. Um, so this one was on my radar. Also, it's translated uh, nonfiction. It's by a woman. It's by a woman of color. All these great things. And I really liked this. Um, I think that possibly the humor, and there's a lot of humor, didn't work as well for me because it's on audio. I probably would have liked it a bit more in print, but take that with a grain of salt because as my family says, my sense of humor was surgically removed at birth, so a lot of stuff just doesn't work for me. So I think it was trying to be humorous, but it felt forced when I was listening to the narration. But everything else was really fun, and this is really just um, my talking about aspects of chemistry that she encounters just through some daily things like cooking breakfast, Teflon pans, baking, um, being in a lab, that sort of research. It's also interspersed with, I think, kind of like essays on what it is like to be a modern scientist and the the academic process and how like competitive and cutthroat it is, how you spend all this time 
you know, working in a lab, getting your degrees, and then you get paid peanuts and may never achieve anything. It's like, why would anybody do this? It's kind of sad, but also amazing that people come out of that process just still very passionate about what they do and their research and everything. So I, yeah, I, I like this a lot and will hopefully find some more books along a similar topic. And that is everything that I read this past week. I'm gonna wrap it up there because I've got somewhere I need to be right now. So let me know if you've also read any of these. If you have any thoughts, please leave them down in the comments for me. I always appreciate hearing from you guys, even if I am very tardy in replying to your comments. I do read them right away. <laughs> anyway, I'll be back soon to talk to you again about more books, and until then, bye.